Good morning, NAI. Before I introduce our speaker today, I want to make a couple of announcements. One is that we were just notified yesterday that the NASA Astrobiology Program website at astrobiology.nasa.gov is one of 11 Webby honorees this year in the category of science websites. And we are in such good company uh, as the California Academy of Sciences and Technology Review and Seed Magazine. So uh, we are really, really thrilled. This website was created by the IT staff, <coughs> excuse me, here at NAI Central. And uh, so we're really thrilled with all of this. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the Astrobiology Program website, I really encourage you to do so. We put a lot of effort and love and energy into it. Uh, and I think it's really a great resource, astrobiology.nasa.gov. And then it has links to NAI, to the XO program, to ASTEP and ASTID. And of course, I'd particularly call your attention to the NAI portion of the site, but we're really, really happy that the site provides access to information uh, and uh, the highlights of the uh, entire astrobiology program. The other thing I want to mention again, I mentioned it at the Monday seminar, uh, is that we have extended the deadline for applications from graduate students and postdocs to attend the annual summer school that we run in Spain in a beautiful castle on the Cantabrian coast uh, with our Spanish partner, the uh, Centro de Astrobiología. So I encourage graduate students and postdocs who would be interested in participating to get applications in, the application process is on our website, and Bruce Runniger is the uh, person who's actually managing this for NAI. The topic this year is extremophiles and extraterrestrial habitability, and the U.S. speakers are going to be John Barris from the University of Washington and Mike Madigan from uh, uh, University of Southern Illinois at Carbondale, and you probably know that Mike is the chief uh, author, editor now of the continuing series of uh, Brock Microbiology. Uh, the European speakers are going to include Ricardo Emiles and David Gilichinsky. So I think it's going to be a really, really good week, and we'd like to see a, a really uh, robust set of applicants. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce somebody who needs no introduction in this community, but I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, that's Dr. Mike Mumma, the PI of the Goddard Space Flight Center team. Mike got his bachelor's in physics from Franklin and Marshall College and his PhD in physics from the University of Pittsburgh. And he has been at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, for most of his career, but I see there is an affiliation with Penn State in there. So, uh, Mike, that was something I didn't know about you. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, let me get right on. First of all, uh, for those of you who haven't finished your income tax return, you have three hours or whatever, I guess until midnight. So I'll try to keep this seminar to no more than 50 minutes in honor of that uh, obligation. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, let's get right on to it. A few general overview slides. This is what we're all after in the NAI. Uh, it's not a trivial question regarding the delivery of water to Earth. Because, as you know, the, uh, the Earth as we know it today is the product of a collision with a Mars-sized protoplanet somewhere on the order of 50 to 100 million years after the proto-Earth was formed. The debris accumulated in the Earth-Moon system, and uh, the Earth at that time was covered by a magma ocean, of which would, of course, uh, have lost whatever primordial atmosphere and oceans it might have been endowed with. Uh, and so a new one had to be delivered. Now, whether some of that came from inside the Earth through continued outgassing, or most of it came uh, by exogenous delivery is one of the key issues that we're interested in. And along with that water came uh, a rich array of organics, uh, prebiotic organics, uh, which is one of the key, key themes of uh, our team. Uh, really, uh, what we do starts with the overall cycle of material, uh, beginning with uh, the uh, diffuse interstellar medium, going on towards the collapse of uh, accumulation and collapse of dense interstellar dust clouds, which are rich in uh, molecular chemistry and also in uh, uh, dust grains themselves. Uh, the formation of young stars in planetary systems from those accreting uh, grains, uh, and then on towards uh, all planets and so forth. 
course, our solar system uh, is the paradigm for the others. Uh, we're interested in, first, the processes that affect ices and dust in protoplanetary disks. There's a, this little cartoon sketches uh, a disk in cross-section, seen at John and some of the key uh, uh, various uh, processes that affect the chemistry are indicated here. I should comment that in recent years, uh, X-ray processing has emerged as a very important uh, new uh, mechanism for uh, producing uh, uh, ion molecule chemistry in regions that UV cannot well penetrate. Uh, and so this has become very, uh, very important in understanding the uh, gradients in chemistry and so on, both with distance above the midplane and also with distance from the young sun. Of course, there's a good deal of accumulation going on as these disks evolve, and ultimately uh, much of that material is delivered to the Earth uh, and other terrestrial planets in the form of uh, uh, meteorites, uh, asteroid fragments, and uh, even the nuclei of comets or comet dust. Uh, so this is another aspect of things we're involved in. We'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, one of the issues uh, that helps us to distinguish uh, what the gradient of organic chemistry really was in material in our early early, uh, early phase of our solar system is the actual uh, isotopic uh, ratio, the isotopologs of water uh, in particular in the icy bodies or of a molecular hydrogen in the gas giants uh, as a function of distance from the young sun. We think that near the, in the terrestrial planets region, uh, water that was formed there and uh, reacted in the gas phase should have very low DOH, probably in equilibrium with nebular hydrogen, uh, or about uh, eight times smaller than terrestrial oceans. Uh, and then uh, water that was a legacy ice from the interstellar cloud core should have a much higher uh, deuterium content, probably a factor of two or three times higher than that in Earth's oceans today. So uh, all of these are keys that were uh, following and uh, trying to get some clues into what really happened. Of course, this will take at least two more renewals in the NAI before we'll have definitive answers. So uh, these uh, were divided essentially into three uh, scientific themes. Uh, and I'm actually going to uh, introduce theme two first, which is uh, the first phase that uh, happens, namely the uh, uh, material in uh, uh, dense cloud cores and uh, disks, uh, and then uh, go on from there to understanding the uh, the truths that we can uh, sample in terms of cometary bodies, um, meteorites, and uh, lunar uh, brushes, and then finally uh, end up with theme four, which is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, theme three is uh, the laboratory processing of astrophysical ice analogs and so on for comparing the chemistry on them. Uh, to clarify processes that actually were effective in uh, uh, mod mod moderating the chemistry of ices on the way from the interstellar uh, dense cloud core to the uh, cometary bodies. And finally, wrap up with uh, some discussion of advanced uh, uh, methodologies being developed for in situ analysis uh, of complex organi organics in the solar system. Now, this is a... Uh, a bit uh, of a revised uh, map of our uh, the co-investigators and topical areas. Before I had organized this according to institution, but it makes far more sense to do so by the topical area. Beginning at the top left, we uh, go around in a clockwise sense, essentially. Uh, we'll talk first about the ISM, the NATO Cloud Core Disks. In blue are the names of the co-eyes who are at, in at universities, and the red uh, are all at Goddard. Um, but you'll notice uh, as you go along here, we've got uh, uh, work on dynamical sculpting. Uh, Hal Levison at Swery is one of the presenters of the Nice model. Cometary composition is heavily uh, centered here in Maryland with a little compliment from Bill Irvine uh, uh, at UMass. He gets us into the uh, large millimeter telescope in Mexico, and that becomes fully operational and uh, so on. Uh, lab work, uh, meteoritics and natural samples, as we call them, is uh, under the direction of uh, Jason Dworkin and his lab. Lunar samples with Rich Walker and so forth. Cosmic Ice Lab with Marla Moore, Reggie Hudson, Dust Lab, Mars Biomarkers, Exoplanets, and finally, on to instrumental techniques and then wrapping it all together and, and, and uh, representing us to the outside world is our EPO lead, who is uh, Cynthia Chung, PhD uh, scientist. 
So I'll uh, just uh, mention a few highlights uh, in this overview. Uh, it is my intent not to overwhelm people who are not in the specific uh, fields that our team works, but uh, uh, to present to you just a, uh, a glimpse of what's going on with hopefully something you can grasp and uh, appreciate and uh, perhaps even uh, become involved in later on if so interested. So first, let's look at uh, some of the things we're doing in the way of interstellar molecules. Uh, this is work being done and led by Jeff Blake at Caltech, um, who's been a member of our team since the beginning. Uh, and Avi Mandel uh, is working uh, intensely with Jeff, and we're also tied in with Avina at uh, and her collaborators, Klaus Pontopi, Don, and so on. We use, uh, Jeff uses uh, Spitzer and Keck, and we're now using uh, ground-based, well, he's been using NIRSPEC at Keck for a long time, and also uh, uh, using uh, the VLT, a high-resolution spectrometer, uh, at the uh, Very Large Telescope, called, the, the spectrometer is called CRIRES. So on the top left here, you just see a uh, typical spectrum. This is in the 14 micron spectral range of acetylene, hydrogen cyanide, and CO2 uh, in the disk around the young star. And from this, you can uh, obtain a lot of information about the physics of the medium, the, the chemistry of the medium, and so forth and so on. Uh, here's an example of some of the work being done on the ground. And the takeaway message here is that from the ground, you can actually detect water vapor uh, at a relatively high temperature, 800 Kelvin, in the disks uh, near these young stars. Uh, and this is particularly happens to be a low mass star relatively young in the first uh, million years of its life. But uh, this way you can really uh, see an awful lot of uh, material uh, and the chemistry and physics that's going on. Now there's an issue as to how far one can push this from the ground. And we know uh, that we'll ultimately need a space uh, observatory to do this in its fullest uh, fruition. But uh, here you can see uh, that on the lower right, uh, Avi's extraction, Avi Mandel's extraction of uh, the OH emission uh, from a, the disk around a uh, Herbie Gate B E star is shown. He's actually pioneered a way of uh, ex extracting these weak emission signals in the presence of the strong stellar continuum and is getting signal to noise ratios on the order of 2,000 to 1 on the stellar continuum. And, and this is actually, I think, the best that uh, has been done so far. Uh, using uh, NERSPEC at CAC or indeed from any ground-based system. So this is actually uh, going on now towards uh, searches for methane and other more interesting organic molecules than just OH. But uh, you can see where this is going. Uh, we'll skip this one. Uh, going on towards another element of our team, uh, we have uh, Carol Grady, Mark Kutchner, and Aki Roberge, who are another organizational unit here at Goddard. Uh, and they are working on disks around uh, young stars. Uh, Carol Grady has been doing this for uh, gee, two decades now and is well known in the field. Uh, Mark uh, and Aki are working on disks and uh, also on exoplanet detections. And uh, we have a large number of missions with which we're involved. You can see uh, on the left of this slide of a uh, five, well actually four missions, uh, Webb telescope in the uh, top left, uh, Epoxy mission, which you'll hear more about, uh, was once called Deep Impact and is now uh, looking at exo Earth as an exoplanet. We'll hear about more about that a little later. Uh, a new concept being developed to image uh, worlds around other stars. This is called the New Worlds Observer, part of the TPF program that we're involved in uh, through uh, Mark and Aki. Uh, an interferometric program uh, to map these uh, regions at high angular resolution and then various theoretical studies. This happens to be a model of a disk uh, under the influence of an Earth mass planet around a, a nearby star, which uh, Mark has developed. We won't have time nor the internet bandwidth to show you the uh, movie of that, uh, but uh, we'll uh, make that available if you're so interested. And there's some contact uh, points over here. You, you'll get this when you see the uh, posted PDF file. It'll go up in a couple of days. You can write all this stuff down or look at it again. So here are a couple of things that are going on. Here's a particular deep debris disk around the young star seen edge on up the upper right. And by looking at the uh, morphology of the disk and uh, its energy budget and so forth, you can learn a good deal about how uh, dust and debris are distributed about that young star. 
likely they're made by the comet asteroid collisions and, ev and evaporation and so forth. And uh, Aki's been studying this since her thesis days, looking at beta pic, uh, measuring isotopic ratios and, and abundance, elemental abundance ratios and so forth. And uh, we'll post a few papers along with our PowerPoint presentation, so those who are interested can, in fact, get into this in a little better, a little greater depth. Uh, we're leading in. This team is leading on towards the Herschel uh, launch this year, uh, which is scheduled for May 6th. Uh, they are, in fact, involved uh, in the uh, so-called GASP project. This is the gas in protoplanetary systems. Uh, there's a plan to observe uh, 250 young stellar systems. And this will, in fact, expand the uh, current database acquired by uh, another part of our team, Jeff Lake and Avina Vandeshoek. Uh, we've observed about 100 young stellar systems using high-resolution infrared from the ground. Uh, so this is, these are the classes of uh, information that one learns from this kind of uh, study. Okay, well then, of course, the key issue, uh, once you know the, that planets can form in these disks or that they, uh, they do, in fact, uh, exist, uh, is to actually characterize their nature. Drake Deming is leading that uh, work for our team and also in, in, uh, through independent funding. He's, he's actually one of the key leaders in the world in this field. Uh, one of the focus foci that he's uh, pursuing at the moment is to... Uh, uh, look at super Earth's orbiting M dwarfs. Uh, this was actually published. Uh, the idea was published um, in Nature uh, late last year, uh, and we followed up with uh, Webb, this Webb telescope, uh, to search for uh, carbon dioxide in the 4.3 micron region. This dip right here, shown at measured at low resolution against the background uh, continuum. Uh, of the uh, planet, and this is in fact the would be the signature of CO2 for a uh, uh, object that's at uh, 22 parsecs distance and has a temperature of 300 Kelvin and so on. So this does look feasible, and this is the class of thing that uh, Drake is doing. The second uh, class of uh, investigation he's pursuing is characterization of Earth as an exoplanet. And this is being done with the epoxy spacecraft, which is in an extended mission phase after its successful targeted uh, impact of a uh, projectile on the, the Temple One nucleus of Temple, Comet Temple One, in 2005. Uh, so they've already, uh, you've heard about this on Monday uh, through uh, when Vicki Meadows gave her synopsis of everything going on in the DPL. But essentially, uh, what's been done now is to demonstrate that uh, looking at the Earth as an exoplanet, as a single pixel, basically, uh, it is possible to separate uh, or identify that there are oceans and continents separately from the actual time signatures of the received signal. As the Earth rotates, that signal changes. And uh, they've demonstrated now in a paper submitted to AppJ that this is, in fact, uh, uh, detectable. I asked Drake yesterday whether, in fact, you could distinguish dust storms on Mars from uh, an ocean on Mars, and uh, he, he sort of looked at me strangely and waffled on the answer. So if he's here today, maybe he'll comment on that a little, a little later. Uh, so keep that, if you have a question about this, uh, keep it in your mind, because we're going to move right along to other topics. Okay, moving along now and coming a little closer to home, uh, we have an active program in modeling uh, chemical processes in uh, uh, nebulae, uh, that is to say dense clouds, and also in uh, the nebulae surrounding young stars. Uh, I showed you this cartoon a little earlier. Uh, Steve Charnley uh, is now a, uh, uh, here at Goddard as a uh, civil servant, and he's leading a group, uh, as he has for the last uh, five years as part of the NAI, and before that, of course, in his uh, other life as uh, just a general theorist. Uh, doing uh, chemistry uh, on uh, the processes that are occurring in this region. And the idea here is to develop quantitative chemical models that uh, then will permit uh, their predictions to be compared with organic uh, and isotopic inventories to help constrain the processes that actually occurred uh, in the regions where this chemistry occurs, namely from a few AU out to perhaps 30 or 40 AU from the young sun. Uh, he also pursues uh, certain uh, astronomical problems through observations, 
And uh, this is, in fact, a detection of doubly deuterated formaldehyde uh, in comet T7, uh, which appeared uh, several years ago, about six or seven years ago. Uh, and indeed, what's really amazing here is that, sorry, it's singly deuterated formaldehyde. Uh, the, the abundance ratio of uh, HDCO was indicative of ion molecule processing at low temperature and not of the D2H ratio in the feedstock from which the uh, ice is formed. Uh, it was uh, HDCO to H2CO was on the order of 30%. Uh, instead of being depleted by a factor of 10 to the uh, few times, uh, well, 50,000. So uh, this was, in fact, evidence that at least in this comet, legacy ices from the natal cloud core were incorporated, or, or uh, the same class of chemistry affected ices uh, in the solar system at a distance where the temperature was similar to that in the natal cloud core. So one always has to remember there are multiple paths to explain a given database, and additional tests are needed before you can constrain uh, these two uh, possibilities, and we are pursuing that. So th these are the sorts of things that uh, Steve has embarked upon. There's a list here. I don't intend to read this to you. You, you all have, uh, can do that for yourself. But the key point is that uh, if you really want to know, follow up this a little more, just... Uh, Google his, uh, his name and uh, uh, astrochemistry, and you're going to find a whole host of papers. He's a very productive uh, and uh, key leader in the field. Okay, now the next thing I want to move on to is uh, work on sculpting of the early solar system. This is, uh, to those of you who work on this uh, field, it's known as the Nice model, after the town in France where... Uh, uh, Morbidelli uh, and his collaborators reside at the Observatoire de Besançon. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, they developed a model which, um, of which uh, Hal Levison from Swiri and Boulder is in fact a co-progenitor. He actually and uh, Morby were two of the key uh, leaders in developing this model. And it, ha it was published uh, for the first time in 2005 and it is not too strong to say that it has revolutionized the field. Uh, it's changed the understanding of almost everything from soup to nuts in terms of uh, the er uh, dispersal of material in the early solar system. So at the top, uh, we show a little cartoon which represents the giant planets. Uh, the sun is on the far left, then uh, uh, 5 AU from the sun, 5 astronomical units for those of you who don't uh, or five times the Earth distance from the Sun, for those of you who don't do astronomy, uh, is shown here, then Saturn. And now, the next planet out is not Uranus, as it is today, but rather Neptune. That's this one. And then Uranus, and both of those planets are within 15 AU of the young Sun, which is very different from their current location. Uh, beyond that, there was a disk of icy planetesimals, and now things start to get interesting. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are actually uh, scattering uh, bodies from their feeding zones in the first uh, few hundred million years of uh, solar system history. And as they do that, they have to move slightly from one another, Jupiter moving inward and Saturn moving outward. And when they hit uh, orbital position such that their periods are in the ratio of two to one, then they can pump each other or their gravity uh, fields can work together to pump other bodies further out uh, and disrupt this outer zone. And what you'll notice here is that the, um, the planets Neptune and Uranus have swapped places and are moving outward and indeed are disrupting this outer disk of, of uh, icy bodies, we call this uh, these planetesimals. Uh, and finally, as time goes on, these are being scattered out, some to the Oort cloud, some to the scattered Kuiper disk, and this is indeed the origin of the scattered Kuiper disk, until finally, at the end of this process, you end up with Uranus at the correct position, uh, now inside of Neptune, which is out at 30 AU, and finally the scattered Kuiper disk and the classical cold disk uh, further out. This is a compelling model for several reasons. It explains many puzzles uh, regarding the solar system, and here is a list of them. And in terms of astrobiology, 
these, of course, are interesting for other reasons, but uh, the late heavy bombardment of the Moon and Earth uh, occurs when the 2 to 1 mean motion resonance is reached and the outer disk uh, is uh, disseminated. And that, in their model, is predicted to occur at just about the right time, at about uh, 700 million years after formation of the Sun or of the earth Moon system. Uh, so that works pretty well, and actually the mass of material delivered to the Moon also works well. Uh, it also suggests that the original out asteroid belt uh, gets disrupted severely and delivers a massive bombardment. It also emplaces the Kuiper belt. Uh, it also suggests that uh, this could create an early massive Martian atmosphere and so forth and so on. And it explains things like the irregular satellites of uh, Saturn. Here's one called Phoebe, which is basically, if you like, an icy planetesimal or comet nucleus, but now in orbit around Saturn. Uh, having been scattered there by this gravitational effect. So here's uh, the way in which these predictions uh, uh, produce um, testable uh, signatures in the comet reservoirs. Uh, firstly, when the inner disk clears, this is when the uh, giant planets are first forming, many of those planetesimals, uh, icy bodies, are scattered to the Oort cloud and some go into this outer icy disk, which becomes a Kuiper disk. And then when the, the mean ro motion resonance occurs and all heck breaks loose, i got to keep it uh, clean here, uh, the uh, outer disk uh, then disrupts and again scatters many bodies to the Oort cloud and some to the Kuiper disk. So. A prediction of this model is that if there was a radial gradient with distant from the young sun, then you should see diverse chemistries of icy bodies in both reservoirs. And uh, finally, the diversity quotients, that is to say that if you have uh, four or five classes of organic chemistries in individual bodies in these reservoirs, you might have more of type A in the first reservoir of the Kuiper belt and uh, less of type A in the Oort cloud, which is of course, mainly formed from bodies that were formed closer into the sun. So these are, then can be compared with uh, cometary composition to indeed see, do we see diversity? Uh, are they different in the two reservoirs and so forth and so on? And then by going back and forth, uh, one can revise the models uh, and the theory and so forth and so on. And so that is where we are going with this. The current observables, the top three bullets there, the check marks, basically are the things we see, these distinct classes of comets, uh, the chemical models that independently predict radio gradients and protoplanetary disks, and finally the NIST model, which predicts significant mixing into different reservoirs, although it, it really desperately needs some of the constraints provided by the first tick mark in order to further refine the NIST model. And then finally, uh, the circled bullets below show what uh, is planned by Hal for his immediate work in the next five years during this uh, pattern. You can read that for yourself uh, when the PowerPoint file has been posted. Okay, uh, so here are the ground truths that we have to work with. Icy bodies um, from the Oort cloud and the Kuiper disk, we, we can tell which, where they came from based on their orbital parameters. Uh, but not where they originally formed from their orbital parameters. That, that information was lost. Uh, also looking at lunar breches and uh, finally looking at meteorites. So let's have a look first at uh, just a quick overview of, of what we're learning about the taxonomy of icy planetesimals. Okay, so here's what we want to do. We're going to do this, uh, all three steps, and these are well in hand now. And we've, We have about 21 comets in our database so far. Uh, of which I'll show you results based on 12. The others, we just published uh, three more, we haven't yet made it into this, uh, the, the synopsis that I'll show you, uh, but will in a few months and then so forth and so on. So we're accumulating new bodies, roughly two per year. We could do more if we had more observing time. Okay, so uh, I showed you this picture of Phoebe at the upper right before, and I show you the actual images of distinct comet nuclei for one and only one reason, and that is to show you, or tell you basically, uh, we can discuss this later as to whether you understand it, but you do not learn much about the origin of the cometary bodies by looking at images of the surface. Takeaway message number one. 
Takeaway message number two, if you look at the individual parent volatiles, these are, we call these parent volatiles, are the chemicals that were formed as ices in the cometary nucleus, were sublimated as the nucleus became activated by solar heat, entered the coma, and now can be measured. These are uh, being pursued vigorously by millimeter and infrared observers. Uh, we do mainly infrared work, but we also are teamed with several groups that uh, do millimeter uh, observing as well, uh, including astronomers at uh, uh, University of Arizona SMT, also at uh, University of Hawaii, and so forth through the Karen Meaches team. Uh, so here on the right, you see a list of molecules that are, are, uh, have been detected so far. And the red bar in each case gives you an idea of the range of abundance ratios seen. Uh, if seen in a number of comets here, for example, CO is seen in more than 10 comets. It's about 20 by now. Uh, and it ranges by almost a factor of 100 in abundance relative to water. Obviously, a clear measure of significant variability. On the other hand, there are a few other uh, chemicals that are seen in only one comet, namely hale bopp the brightest comet ever quantified with modern instrumentation. And so we don't have much information from them except an existence theorem. We don't know much about how that, that varies from uh, body to body. Now, the infrared is especially powerful in this regard. And the key reason is the advent of cross-dispersed shell spectrometers, at, uh, particularly uh, at Keck. Uh, and on the left here, you see a list of chemicals, uh, all of which can be measured simultaneously with water. Uh, and when I say simultaneously, I mean at every uh, point along the uh, entrance aperture of the spectrometer, we can measure half a dozen of these species and water always at the same time. Uh, enough said. I won't go into any more detail than that, except to tell you that when we do that, we have removed most sources of systematic error. As if you did each molecule separately on, say, night to night or with different instruments, then you'd always have to worry about observational um, artifacts such as the atmospheric turbulence and so forth and so on. Well, let's look at how these, uh, these comets stack up one, once, against one another. And this, uh, this slide, I want you to draw attention to uh, two aspects of it. First, uh, the comet number, there's a key on the left. You can look at that later on. It doesn't really matter for the moment. It's given by on, on the bottom axis. So these are just individual comets running from left to right. So next, I want you to look at this chart right here, which shows you the abundance of methanol. These two comets have methanol in the order of 4% relative to water. The next group uh, has methanol at about 2% relative to water. And then finally, there's a group over here where it's depleted by an order of magnitude. Same thing happens for ethane, the last uh, molecule that I will mention. And I will just tell you that these two are highly correlated. I'll show you in the next slide. But notice that for the high ethane comets, there's one from the Oort cloud and one from the Kuiper belt. And from the, the low methanol comets, there's one from the Oort cloud and one from the Kuiper belt. Yet, uh, normal populations are dominated by the Oort cloud just because we have more of those in our database. But we do also see some in the Kuiper belt. So here you see immediate evidence that of the three distinct groups of comets, members of each group are found in each dynamical reservoir. That tells you that uh, the key will be to identify the fractions of each class that are in each reservoir, because that's what tells you uh, the, something about the dynamics in the region of the solar system from each which each reservoir received its members. Now I promise to show you those same uh, two data sets on ethane in a different way. And here it is shown as a bar chart. Uh, basically, this is a factor of two in each case. Uh, here's the normal population. You can see about a dozen comets in that. Maybe it's actually ten. It's seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, the enriched group is over here, and this is the depleted group here. And the methanol shows a somewhat similar distribution. So we think these are probably uh, uh, somewhat realistic. We don't know yet whether this is going to fill in and become just a single broad distribution. But so far, we really haven't seen uh, evidence that that is so. Uh, there are two other parameters we're after, which will tell us more about uh, uh, the uh, place of origin in the protoplanetary disk or natal cloud core. 
the first one is the so-called nuclear spin temperature uh, in water, and now it's being pursued in ammonia and methane as well. Basically, this the idea here is that uh, the proton carries a spin of one half spin angular momentum, and so if you have two protons, they, the spins can be aligned or anti-aligned to give you one or zero as a total. And this gives you different weights, and they have slightly different lower state energies, so you can have a temperature effect. Uh, if they formed at uh, low temperature, you'll have very little of the higher, higher excitation state. If they formed at higher temperature, you'll have a lot. And so here's an example for uh, about a dozen comets showing the range of such uh, spin temperatures measured in these different comets. And they typically uh, range, uh, I'd say a modal value is around 30 Kelvin which is um, uh, cold enough to actually cause these spins to be uh, relaxed. And so this gives you a way of identifying something about the origin of the water in a given comet in this way. The second uh, modality is to look at the D to H ratio in individual volatiles. And that's been pursued mainly for water vapor, but a little for HCN. And uh, people are on the track of doing it, as you heard a minute ago, for formaldehyde, HDCO in particular, but also for uh, uh, other species such as deuterated ethane and deuterated methane. The key point is that um, the take home message is although so far uh, most comets that have been sampled show a D to H ratio of about uh, twice that found in mean ocean water. Uh, we think that may be related to the fact that they are all of the same organic group. They are all organic normal comets. We don't yet see any, D to H, have not gotten a D to H measurement in any comet that is organics depleted, which is the signature we think of forming in the higher temperature region uh, of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, or even closer. Well, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, let me just say then that of the data set that I showed you a minute ago, here are the key parameters we're after. We only have D to H and uh, three such comets uh, in this group that I'm showing the temp spin temperatures in a few comets. And in those comets, we also have good uh, organic uh, composition. So very crudely, and, and perhaps incorrectly, we don't know for sh this for sure, but there's a suggestion that the high temperature comets that show high spin temperatures are the ones that have depleted organics. The very lowest temperature uh, spin, uh, if you like, is T-spin about 21 Kelvin, which suggests they, they were, have very high, uh, uh, are enriched in organics, and the organic normals seem to be intermediate. Very, very incomplete data set. It's expanding rapidly, but in the next five years, we intend to fill this in extensively and hope we will have a far more definitive uh, story to tell you about that. But this is work in progress at the present time. Okay, I'm just going to flash this uh, chart. You can actually uh, read this once the PowerPoint is is posted, but uh, basically as a synopsis of what we've learned so far and what I've told you and where we're going in future. Now, the second ground truth uh, we should turn to is not remote observations, but observations, uh, measurements in the laboratory on, on authentic samples, uh, especially of uh, extraterrestrial organics returned by uh, meteorites and also uh, by stardust samples. I think you've, uh, you've heard some, of, some aspects of uh, Similar work from uh, the Carnegie team uh, when George presented uh, his summary earlier on. Uh, in any case, this is being done now in the advanced, uh, we call it the Astrobiology Analysis Lab uh, here at uh, Goddard uh, under the direction of Jason Dworkin uh, with collaborators uh, shown down here. Mike Callahan is a postdoc, uh, Jen Eigenbrode, El Jamie Elsa Cook, and Danny Glavin, Zita Martin, and uh, Jen Stern. And uh, what uh, we actually started with a bare bones uh, derelict lab four years ago, five years ago, and then uh, Jason converted that into a, a state of the art uh, a laboratory for analysis of complex organics uh, in uh, these uh, samples. Uh, let's take an example of something that he's uh, recently been working on. This is uh, uh, using the Stardust uh, uh, 
oil samples, not the actual grain samples themselves or grain tracks, but uh, taking samples of, of aluminum foil that were actually uh, used to uh, isolate the uh, uh, cells and also to uh, uh, essentially uh, protect them. But in any case, these things are uh, impacted by cometary uh, gases uh, and occasionally grains. Uh, and the point is that on, on the back side of these cells, actually found evidence for uh, two uh, different uh, compounds, methylamine and ethylamine, here and here. And uh, there's some possibility that these were, in fact, uh, either reacted within the uh, foil from methane and ammonia uh, injected by the comet, or actually could have been present as these compounds in the cometary atmosphere itself. And I think Jason's standing by to ask answer questions about that if you'd like to ask any during the question period. Lately, they've been looking for uh, cometary glycine. Uh, and in particular, um, this is um, the isotopic uh, enrichment for uh, delta 13C in glycine, as uh, derived uh, by uh, Jamie Elsula. And what you'll notice is that uh, it, it does appear to have an extraterrestrial signature. Uh, this has now been submitted for publication, uh, I think uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and so this work is uh, uh, proprietary and, and should not be distributed further uh, until after it has been accepted and preprints are distributed. Uh, so have a good look at this slide. You will not see it in our public version of the uh, talk to be uh, placed on the website. But uh, the net uh, you should take away message is that there is glycine present in the sample, uh, and it does appear to have an extraterrestrial signature. It is not depleted in, in uh, 13C by the 20 to 70 parts per mil that you would normally expect for uh, terrestrial biological samples. Now, one result that, uh, in fact, uh, is published uh, is this one by uh, uh, Glavin and Dworkin, in which they have looked for uh, uh, and antiemetic excesses in amino acids in uh, meteoritics, uh, particularly the uh, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, Murchison, which is a CM, and several others. And the key point is that uh, they have, in fact, uh, seen a very large excess in uh, um, L isovaline, uh, reported at 18%, uh, and uh, is largest uh, seen to date. They now have. Um, L to the excess ratios, and, and I think it's four uh, examples of uh, primitive meteorites. You can read this in PNAS. It just came out, or it's about to. It's online now in the PNAS uh, under Lavin and Dworkin. And uh, earlier uh, papers were published on some aspects of the work, but this is the uh, definitive work. One of the keys was to identify um, a... Uh, I guess it's actually later on in another view graph, which I'll show you, but there can be another uh, organic which elutes together with uh, L isovaline, which they have successfully uh, isolated and separated, uh, which uh, permits a uh, unique uh, conclusion shown here. Okay, then uh, other aspects of work that's going on is to uh, look at specific isotopic analyses. This is with the uh, uh, isotope ratio mass spectrometer, which Goddard funded. This was not funded through NAI. Most of the early uh, analytical tools were funded through the uh, GCA uh, team budget, some by Goddard through matching funds and so on. But the, the new IRMS is uh, funded wholly by Goddard. Uh, and again, here's the process to look for these uh, end heterocycles uh, and uh, then establish their isotopic ratios. And this is compare those with RNA uh, molecules and so forth. And you can see that already there's uh, work going on uh, that has uh, identified uracil and xanthine with uh, excesses of carbon-13 by uh, about 38 to 45 parts per mil. And you can uh, see uh, earlier uh, work was published by uh, Zeta Martins and uh, collaborators here uh, and at Carnegie uh, through Marilyn Vogel's uh, group. Uh, in that I think she's uh, involved in that paper as well. Now, another aspect of this lab is to look at the uh, complex organics and extraterrestrial uh, analogs. And, uh, of course, many of you, uh, your teams are involved in the ASAP program, which Danny Glavin coordinated and led. 
so some of that work is uh, uh, reflected in the public that came out of this lab. Uh, also looking at some uh, work samples returned by Jen Eigenbrod uh, from uh, her uh, the latest Valborn expedition. She collected certain ice samples uh, and those are being analyzed here, plus something on a common desert and so forth. Again, amino acids and nucleobases and so forth and so on. And finally, uh, analysis of amino acids from the historical, uh, the residue left from Stanley Miller's uh, historical uh, uh, spark discharge experiments, which was published recently uh, and uh, which many of you have undoubtedly uh, read. Something new that's going on is this development of uh, nanoflow liquid chromatographic analysis for uh, trace detection. There's a little sketch of the instrument in the upper left. Uh, it's rather specialized uh, and so not of interest to most people in the institute, but uh, perhaps three of the instrument teams uh, doing this kind of work will find this interesting. I encourage you to look at this uh, in greater detail on, on the uh, published uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. But on the right, for everyone else, just note that uh, the standard analysis of uh, this particular uh, amino isobutyric acid at 10 to minus 15 level shows a very weak peak at this position. But uh, with this new nanoflow analysis, you can then see that the same, uh, uh, basically aliquot uh, from the same uh, material uh, shows a much stronger and far a better signal to noise ratio on this peak and therefore is showing much higher sensitivity. So this, uh, this is actually quite uh, exciting because it demonstrates that uh, sensitivity by this approach is, is tremendously enha enhanced. Let's move on to uh, the second, uh, well really the third class of uh, ground truths which I would say are uh, uh, lunar samples. These are actually uh, Rich Walker, a co at the University of Maryland in the Geosciences Department, is uh, actually pursuing this uh, line of uh, uh, evidence on under uh, GCA funding through NAI. Uh, what they're really doing is they uh, basically are after this question of massless compositions and timing of uh, material added to the Earth-Moon system late on. So this goes back and relates to the if you like, the depletion of the uh, asteroid belt, primitive asteroid belt that was mentioned when I discussed Hal Levison's work in the, with the Nice model. Uh, and so uh, the issue of what was delivered at that time, did it come only from asteroids, did some come from the outer disk, and so forth and so on, is, is of keen interest. We'd like to know whether they also brought organic molecules to the Earth. Do any survive on the moon uh, that would have been delivered at the same time? So the methodology is fairly well understood. You basically crunch uh, a uh, brush of sample and then carefully, painstakingly pick out the pieces of uh, interest and then begin to uh, look at those uh, by uh, doing these, uh, determining their elemental and isotopic ratios in these individual rocks. And so here's an example on the right chart of the classes of data that were determined by uh, Igor Puchtel, who was supported by GCA funds. Uh, working on these samples with Rich. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, for a given sample, you get specific uh, ratios. But as you go to mo uh, additional ones, then you develop a slope, a mixing line, if you like, uh, which gives you the slope of which, uh, by comparison, then gives you the ratios uh, of the uh, various uh, elements in these particular uh, group of samples. So in this case, showing iridium uh, versus these other uh, compounds. Then once you have that, you can then compare those with uh, primitive meteorites. Here, for example, is another measure of the osmium isotopic uh, ratios for carbonaceous versus ordinary anencitite chondrites on the left. And then the primitive earth, uh, primitive, uh, uh, earth mantle shown here. And what you see is the Apollo samples have a range of values that uh, represent different classes of impacting bodies. Uh, there's an issue, though, as to what is uh, the, what's the implication of these non-zero intercepts down here, because if uh, if the feedstock were only of one type, they should all go through zero, you would think. And so the non-zero intercept is being pursued present time as uh, possible evidence for a second uh, impactor, and one way of doing that is to look at pristine lunar rocks uh, that did not have these. Uh, uh, um, spikes, uh, these other, any uh, contributions of an, another impactor in them, 
these are HSC is just highly siderophile elements, a fancy word for those of you who don't work in this field, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the uh, it shouldn't be here. Uh, in any case, uh, so we're going along and trying to figure all this out, and uh, uh, that is the next step, which will be pursued in the next few years under GCA funding. Now let's move on to uh, not the ground truths uh, provided by natural samples, but uh, by uh, the study of processes in the laboratory that could be analogs for uh, radiation processing of cosmic ices on the, on the first uh, instance, or of cosmic uh, or things we're learning about dust formation and organics uh, related to dust in the second instance. So first, the lab uh, headed by Marla Moore, now Reggie Hudson, who's been a co-I for many years, is now here at Goddard as a civil servant. Uh, John Peters and Claudia Nez, probably working both here with Marla and also with uh, uh, Lee Mundy at the University of Maryland on uh, 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 material, in, particularly acetylene and uh, disks around young stars. So Claudia now bridges the laboratory work here at Goddard with the, uh, some of the observational work going on at uh, at Maryland. And Zahn, of course, is a uh, former student of uh, Pascal Ehrenfreund's uh, at uh, uh, Leiden, who is uh, now associated with the Wisconsin team and also ours, but uh, is actually uh, here at uh, George Washington University in the Washington area. Okay, so basically uh, what's, what we have here is uh, a unique facility at Goddard which has uh, a proton accelerator uh, and Marla and, uh, is able to direct a uh, 2 MeV proton beam uh, into a sample chamber in which she has deposited uh, uh, mixtures of pure ices at uh, a specific low temperature, typically a starting temperature on the order of a few tens of Kelvin. She can then uh, choose to irradiate that with a proton beam or with a kilovolt electron beam to simulate X-ray processing or with UV photons to simulate UV processing. So any one of these can be dealt with uh, in order to try to uh, separate the kinds of processing that might lead to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, complex organics of one type or another. So let's look at some examples. One of the most exciting things that's happened recently is that this, this A here is a picture of the feedstock and her apparatus, and you can see kind of a uh, brownish uh, coating left on the feedstock after she's uh, finished irradiating that. She's vaporized any uh, processed ices that have uh, been formed and analyzed those both first with IR uh, absorption spectroscopy, then after vaporization with GCMS and so on. But now what has frustrated people in the past was not being able to analyze the residue. Uh, that has now changed, and so what happens now is she uh, uh, reduces this, provides a scrapings of this residue, and aliquot is uh, formed. It's passed through the organic, the astrobiology anal analytical uh, uh, lab, uh, and uh, the actual uh, materials identified in that are identified. And this has actually produced some very, very exciting results. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the key things is that it's shown that uh, there was, in fact, uh, a rich array of amino acids, C5 amino acids, for example, are formed in these residues, identified by uh, Jason and his collaborators in, in their lab. But, but to the great surprise, uh, there was a great excess in uh, L isovaline over D isovaline. Once this was uh, actually looked at more carefully, it was then realized that there was an eluding uh, compound, uh, this three amino pentanoic acid, which was coming off at the same time as the L-isovaline and, and actually giving rise to a, a, a spurious uh, excess here. But even so, uh, once that has been done, the excess does remain uh, in the case of the merchant meteorite right, and so forth and all as well. Now, not being con content with uh, doing uh, first-line work on processing of ices that might find their ways into comets, um, Reggie and Marla are also working intensely on uh, uh, ices that uh, could be processed in the uh, Titan system, which is, uh, we all know, is one of the key uh, focus groups uh, within the, uh, the Icy Worlds focus group within the NAI. So this work, uh, is, I think, uh, is going on now. It's uh, Many nitriles are being produced, uh, along with uh, 
various amino acids and so forth, and uh, this is going to be, you can have a quick look at this by this uh, paper in Astrobiology in 2008, uh, but there's much more to come that we don't have time to talk about today, but Marla's here in the room and she could certainly answer questions for anyone who wishes after this uh, seminar ends. All right, so I'm going to, we're running out of time, but of course Carl took uh, 15 minutes to begin with, so <laughs> uh, no, just teasing. But uh, the Cosmic Dust Lab, uh, Joe Nuth has uh, been looking at the issue of uh, fischer trupps reactions uh, on uh, dust grains that might catalyze uh, the production of organics from CO and methane in the early uh, protoplanetary disk. And uh, to make a long story quite brief, what he finds is that as soon as you make an organic coating on the, the grain, uh, the coating itself becomes a better catalyst than the grain was, uh, no matter what the grain material uh, that you started with. And so these are examples of what they do. They actually have these long time uh, sequences where they look at the uh, buildup of this uh, uh, organic uh, coating and then the uh, the uh, reaction rates of uh, different chemicals that are produced. And the net uh, is uh, shown here that uh, as the reaction proceeds, basically uh, the coating itself is a better catalyst than the initial substrate. Uh, maybe that's not so, uh, that should have been intuitive in the sense that uh, in order to have reactions, you normally have to have hydrogen bonding going on uh, initially to hold things there. So uh, generally, um, silicon or magnesium silicates or uh, graphite uh, would have highly variable bonding, but uh, or the organic coatings that you've made then uh, do have very strong hydrogen bonds and so you can hold things more efficiently to the surface and so forth to catalyze more efficient reactions. This obviously has uh, relevance uh, to outward transport of material yeah. in these organic coatings that may have some relevance to uh, the rims seen on certain uh, elements of meteoritics such as chondrules, uh, it may have other uh, implications as well, but it does appear to be uh, a rather interesting uh, finding and uh, probably uh, it will be of interest to many other uh, members of the NAI. I will say a few words about uh, other planets in our solar system. We've touched on Titan. Most of what I've said so far has to do with delivery of uh, organics and water to the terrestrial planets. And so it's important to understand whether any other terrestrial planets have uh, any evidence whatsoever that could have been related to uh, the origin of uh, life or to processes that might mimic uh, the release of materials that could mimic the uh, biogenesis. So methane on Mars you've heard about before. I'm not going to dwell on that except to remind you of the sources of methane on Earth that are mainly uh, biogenic in origin. To show you one spectrum which demonstrates uh, the detection of water lines here, here, a total of three in this case, and methane running north to south on the planet from limb to limb. The maps that we derive from that, uh, basically, this is now from the science paper that appeared uh, online in January and in print in February. And uh, we now see three distinct regions of active release that are correlated with certain mineralogical signatures, also from the science paper. Uh, and finally, that uh, what we now are preparing our second paper. Uh, Geronimo's uh, will be submitting that very soon. And uh, here, for example, we demonstrate uh, the map of methane from all seasons shown here, the three regions that we showed in our first paper, uh, comparing that with water that is co-measured in every spectrum with methane, noting that at times we don't see methane, but Um, are we back? Okay. Uh, but the key point is whenever we see methane being released, it's from primitive uh, terrain, Noachian being uh, the first billion years of Mars history and shown here is this red terrain in the uh, southern region. So there's a lot more to come on that story. You can read all the details and major conclusions uh, and implications uh, when you next come back to this in, in the online material. Now, finally, I want to conclude with the development of uh, model the uh, techniques for in situ organic, an organic analysis on flight missions, which is a very key uh, part of work here at Goddard through Paul Mahaffey's team. 
which as you know, Paul is the principal investigator on the uh, SAM instrument on the Mars Science Lab, which is now scheduled for launch in 2011. But that's just one of the many, many uh, parts uh, that, of the activity that this uh, uh, group is involved in. Uh, there are actually four separate uh, tasks that are being in part supported by the GCA, though I must say that uh, generally our support is modest compared to the total costs required to uh, pursue these tasks. I mean, you're talking about multiple people and expensive equipment, and frankly, uh, this work draws on far larger funding resources than we could possibly provide through uh, any one uh, team at the NAI. Uh, there are many words in these view graphs, and so I'm going to skip through these very quickly, and those of you who have great interest can go back and re uh, review them at uh, in your, your leisure. Uh, for example, just as one, uh, one case here, this is a, a sample that was collected by uh, Jen Eigenbrod uh, up in Svalbard, and essentially uh, the new approach is revealing uh, three molecular biosignatures that are uh, that were missed by uh, another common method. Uh, we can't talk about these in detail right now, except the takeaway message is that these new methodologies that are being developed are, in fact, more powerful and providing additional results that were not accessible in other ways. Uh, so these are the ASAP program, which many of you know about, and what's going on there, and I don't want to repeat that. You can look at this at your leisure. One of the key uh, areas being developed is by Will Brinkerhoff and his collaborators. Uh, this is a so-called laser desorption approach. Instead of cooking uh, the sample and destroying many, thereby destroying many of the organics, instead you uh, focus a laser beam on a point on the surface and then you can vaporize that material. It's somewhat less destructive, but you can then see a wider range of heavy organics uh, to much higher Dalton number, or for those of you who don't work in Dalton's atomic mass units, than you would otherwise see. And so this is a very uh, potentially extremely powerful technique that could be useful on flight missions to uh, comets or to primitive asteroids and so forth and so on, or even to Titan itself. An example uh, is shown here of uh, organics produced from a, a, uh, an analysis of a Titan Tholen analog produced in the laboratory, which uh, could reveal a polyacetylene uh, phase present in the material. Here's a sketch of the instrument. Uh, you can imagine how you raster across the surface of uh, uh, section material and then get these uh, beautiful uh, mass spectra in, uh, in, in this way. Now uh, another approach being pursued uh, by a number of complementary programs has to do with this uh, business of carbonation of meteorites we've been discussing, looking for signatures of life and ice. This is funded under exobiology uh, and so on. Can't say too much about that now. And actually, we're supporting some, some of Jen's manpower through GCA. But uh, uh, as you can appreciate, the, the overall uh, program involved in Paul's group is far broader and uh, far more expensive than uh, the NAI could possibly support. And so you see here just a listing of some of the other uh, activities and the PIs and so forth that are going on that uh, actually benefit the NAI by uh, essentially we're leveraging these other very large and well-funded programs. And finally, uh, just wrap that up by pointing to the sample analysis at Mars. Uh, Here's an example of one of the four uh, finalists for the MSL landing site. This is the Evers Volta crater, which, crater, which has a well-developed uh, delta, river delta, which uh, formed over a long period of time and suggests that there could have been flowing uh, water and standing water for quite a long time that would permit uh, organics uh, uh, to uh, be formed. Uh, of course, everyone would like to know whether they were formed biogenically or abiotically. So I think we'll stop with that and uh, throw the uh, uh, throw it open for discussion if anyone has any questions. Let me just go back to the, in case we need to go to a specific slide. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, let, let's first thank our speaker, Mike. Thanks for a 
really information-filled talk. I am sure a lot of people are going to be looking at the archive on the website. Now, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions right away, and I'd like to ask the first question. And I must confess this question may be more appropriate for Alan Boss than for you, but in the Nice model, you've got the core, you've got Uranus and Neptune forming so close to Saturn, and so now you have all four major planets forming within less than 10 AU. You've got 300 Earth masses of hydrogen and helium in Jupiter. You've got maybe 85 in Saturn. And with Uranus and Neptune forming right nearby, you've only got one Earth mass of hydrogen and helium on their cores. How do you get that difference, particularly between Saturn and the Uranus and Neptunes, uh, mm -hmm. when they're formed so close to one another? Um. Well, Alan, if you'd like to answer that, that's just fine. <laughs> Let me take now, a shot at it. I'll give my own spin on it later. <laughs> okay, uh, Carl, I think what, what uh, you hit a really major question, which is the Nice model is wonderful if you can figure out a way to get those initial conditions. But in some sense, those initial conditions are like handing somebody a tin can with a spring compressed inside it. And you ask them to open up the, the lid of the can, and the spring pops out. And the question is, how did that spring manage to compress itself inside that can? So... In the context of the traditional core accretion model making the gas giant planets, it's a little bit harder to imagine doing it because you do, as you say, have to form all four of them within a rather small region of space, and that process by definition takes maybe a million years or more for core accretion. And so it takes a while for that, uh, you can't, it's sort of hard to imagine that spring managing getting itself inside the can. I would assert, though, that the alternative, which is to try to make the gas giants more rapidly by the disk instability process, uh, really is a way of making, maybe getting that spring in there rather quickly because if you can make them fast enough uh, and then pull the gas away and let things evolve as the NIST model envisions, uh, perhaps that's the way to get there. In fact, I mentioned that to Hal Levison at a Nobel conference a couple summers ago and Hal says, well, let's, can you actually do the same sort of thing in disk instability? I've got models running right now on the computer that are trying to see what the disk instability alternative is. But I think the basic idea, though, of the NIST model is sort of working backwards in time, saying if you can somehow get to this intermediate stage, then things really work out nicely to go from there to the present. And the real question then is for the theorists, how do you get from the very beginning to that stage? And that's where uh, folks like Hal Levison and I have a lot of work to do yet. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, actually, Thank you. Uh, that was a nice, that was a nice uh, discussion, uh, Alan. Uh, and and I, I glossed over that first, uh, as you know, the first few hundred million years when the giant planets form. I think Hal has too. <laughs> but uh, the key, in terms of the uh, creation of the, the icy uh, planetesimal reservoirs and uh, how we can further constrain the NIST model by measuring compositions of comets, D to H ratios, and so on. We think that's the only way one can really make progress in, in further understanding the limitations of that model or its, or its successes. So basically, uh, looking at these ground truth uh, uh, objects and then understanding, trying to understand what, what actually did happen, uh, from what region of the protoplanetary disk those materials did come, uh, and then go back and ask, okay, did we start out with those four planets in those locations because in the first million years they all formed then through instabilities or at that location or, or what? I think there's a lot of work still to be done in that question. We have a question here at Ames from uh, Dave Dimeray. Yeah, uh, Mike, that, uh, it was really fascinating to see the uh, comet work and the uh, inference maybe of multiple populations emerging. Um, what about regular uh, or carbonaceous chondrites? You guys, of course, are involved with the uh, analyses of amino acids and stuff in the rocky-type uh, meteorites. Any parallel effort that might be useful? Well, I really ought to turn that over to Jason or Danny uh, because they've been working on that here. Um, I don't think they're in the room, uh, but uh, if anybody's online, they can certainly leap in. Uh, but in any case, uh, that is obviously one of the things we'd really like to do. You're certainly well aware, Dave, that uh, the other example is the Stardust samples, which show, I think Carnegie has shown this very nicely, they show very strong evidence for uh, dust that's processed in the terrestrial planets region and then pr uh, moved outward. So um, one of the things I didn't have time to address was we're very interested in this question of what happened before the uh, icy bodies and the meteorites, uh, the parent bodies of meteorites formed. That is to say, uh, from the natal cloud core going through the uh, uh, protoplanetary disk, there was a great deal of dynamical mixing going on as well as chemical processing. 
that preceded the formation of the, the giant planets and, and, of course, the minor bodies as well. So the only way we're ever going to get a handle on that is to do just exactly what you're suggesting, namely the uh, organic composition of individual inclusions and meteoritics, uh, primitive meteorites in particular, the uh, uh, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, additional comet samples, and so forth and so on. So I think that's uh, that, that whole area of understanding is still uh, only sparsely uh, sampled and sparsely understood. Do we have any other questions for Mike or for anyone else? Alan? Is it possible to ask questions by phone? Yes, absolutely. That sounds like Max. You're dead right. It is Max. I hope Good. I'm not Great. dead right, Max. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, uh, for just a preface uh, statement, I'm glad I got my tax return in early given the time now. Um, <laughs> The question I'm asking is, is there scope with your method of relating DH ratios and volatile ratios to differentiate the origin of these materials, the late delivery, and subsequent um, similar fractionation processes on planetary surfaces for, for loss of volatiles, like, say, on Earth and on Mars? Um, well, let's first talk about the... Um the lessons learned from D to H in a primitive body, whether a comet or uh, an asteroid. I know more about the volatiles and comets than I know about asteroids, so perhaps someone else could address the latter question. But uh, as you well know, that uh, you probably remember, Max, that uh, and Hal Bopp, uh, Toby Owen, uh, and his uh, collaborator, postdoc Roland Meyer, and others measured uh, the uh, ratio of DCN to HCN and HDO to H2O in the same comet. And they found that the ratios of uh, the enrichment of deuterium in those two chemicals was quite different. Uh, and this, in fact, is predicted if both were uh, influenced by ion molecule processing at a temperature of about 30 Kelvin. Uh, you would then expect uh, the uh, deuterium content of HCN to be uh, much more enriched than that in H2O. Uh, so this was, in fact, uh, their conclusion that it was that those ices were processed at about 30 Kelvin. That, of course, then is consistent with the modal um, orthopower ratio that we see in most of the organic normal comets, and Hale-Bopp was an or organic normal comet. Uh, so we think that um, when you consider outward convection of or mixing of uh, deuterium poor water from the terrestrial planets region in the protoplanetary disk to the, uh, let's say, 10 to 30 AU region um, in the disk. Uh, when that water condenses, it should carry into the uh, newly formed ice deuterium uh, at a much lower ratio. In fact, uh, the temperature is so high in the terrestrial planets region that uh, the water in the gas phase there should achieve equilibrium with molecular hydrogen, it should have a D to H ratio of order 2 times 10 to the minus 5, instead of uh, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4, as in uh, terrestrial ocean water, or 3 times 10 to the minus 5, 4, excuse me, as in hale bopp So we think that uh, we don't yet have those numbers for the organic depleted comets in hand. And we think that uh, all of the comets measured so far uh, are the organics normal type uh, in the D to H ratio on water. And uh, most of them uh, have, in fact, they all have uh, uh, enrichment factors which agree with one another within experimental error, though one must be careful because some of the measurements have very large systematic errors or properties of systematic uncertainty and these are usually glossed over in the literature. And so uh, it may be that the agreement so far is um, not a valid reflection of the true values. So I, I personally regard this field as one that is about to break open because uh, we now have the ability to measure multiple lines of HDO in the infrared at the same time that we measured multiple lines of H2O in the same object. I mean the same time, in the same 
spectrum with a cross dispersed to shell spectrometer. And this will eliminate uncertainties as to whether the rotational temperatures of the molecules are the same, and therefore whether you are uh, estimating the total population correctly. It will eliminate all kinds of uh, uncertainties with respect to the observing conditions and so on. And so I think this is how we will build a uh, very robust and very reliable uh, uh, database for deuteration fractions and comets that have most systematic errors removed from the uh, data. Now, so far as the meteoritics are concerned, uh, oh, actually, let me go to the second aspect of your question, which was the planetary enrichment factors. Uh, uh, primitive planets uh, like the young Earth can experience a blow off of their early atmospheres, hydrodynamic blow off. This has been uh, examined by Peplin and uh, Hunton and other early workers uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, who showed that you could, in fact, produce enriched deuterium in this way. Uh, on Earth. On the other hand, we don't know uh, how much water, how much more correctly, how much hydrogen is sequestered in the core. And uh, as you know, at the, uh, the workshop in Molokai, sponsored by NAI and organized by Karen Meech's team, uh, we had 30 people who uh, examined all aspects of this question. And the simple answer is you could have as much as seven to a hundred oceans of water equivalent hydrogen sequestered in the core, but in doing so, it's likely that deuterium was fractionated. Uh, and therefore, some uh, fraction of the enrichment in terrestrial ocean water could be uh, a signature of, in part of that process. So uh, when you say we're going to get the D2H ratio in classes of comets, we're going to identify whether depleted uh, organic comets have low D to H and therefore and uh, formation temperatures that suggest uh, uh, origins of the material in the say 5A to 10AU region versus other enriched uh, comets in deuterium and in organics that form from legacy ices further out, even that will not be a full answer. We still must pursue the issue of what happened uh, when the Earth-Moon system uh, evolved and how did the uh, expression of hydrogen from the deep earth uh, reveal itself in the form of deuteration in the water uh, that we now see in Earth's oceans. I think I should stop there, suggest maybe we have other discourse and discussions offline. Thank uh, Mike. At the, thanks, Mike. At the risk of causing some of you to file for tax extensions, I'll call on Alan Boss. I believe he had a question. Yeah, I'll make a quick uh, comment and a question. This, the comment first is to uh, thank you, Carl, for organizing a series of uh, team presentations because I think they're very valuable for allowing all of us to see across the whole institute what's going on. I've only seen a couple of them because I've been on a lot of travel lately, but the two I've seen this week are really quite valuable, so I'm looking forward to seeing more. Question for do, Michael. Yeah. Do, check the do check the archive. They're all up there. You can see them all. Okay, th thanks, Carl. Question for Michael has to do with um, uh, when you're talking about the nuclear spin temperatures and the earth apparel ratios and things with very low, really nice low temperatures, 20, 30, 40 degrees uh, Kelvin or so. Question is, presumably those are being measured by molecules being sublimated off the surfaces of comets. Uh, and the, I would guess the kinetic temperatures are actually quite a bit higher than that when they're being sublimated. So is there a correction that's made for that or how do you... How do you look at a rather higher temperature species and infer a lower temperature? I, I just technical question, just how it's done. Uh, right. Uh, I actually published a paper in 1987, which after the Comet Halley campaigns that laid out the methodology for that. It appears in astronomy and astrophysics. And that was the first comet for which we got such <laughs> measurements uh, that showed a, a relaxed OPR and the spin temperature of about 35 Kelvin. But in any case, what we do is... Uh, we now measure uh, up to several dozen lines of water vapor uh, simultaneously using the Keck or NERSC uh, BLT uh, high dispersion infrared spectrometers. Uh, and these, uh, we then uh, use those to compare with a model, a fluorescence model for the ortho ladder separately from the one of the para ladder. And that gives us the populations of those two spin species. It turns out that the lowest level in the um, ortholatter 
has an energy that's about uh, 34 Kelvin higher than uh, 34 wave numbers, excuse me, higher than the, uh, uh, the ground level, which is in the paraladder. And so you can apply a Boltzmann-like uh, term to that to extract the effective spin temperature that is required to explain the observed distribution. Now it turns out that um, these two species, ortho and para water, are almost like uh, two independent elements. They uh, might as well be oxygen and nitrogen, because although uh, it's, it's a bit of an overstatement, uh, but you can actually convert one to the other uh, not too di with not too much difficulty, but doing it differentially is extremely difficult and requires a huge number of collisions. You need to do it in the presence of a non-uniform uh, external magnetic field. So you need a uh, something like a paramagnetic substance like platinum or uh, another s uh, molecule that has an unpaired electron like molecular oxygen and so forth. But otherwise, uh, mere sublimation does not do it. Uh, simple warming of the substance does not do it. Uh, and so on. The most extreme example is molecular hydrogen, of course, which has been studied for since the 20s uh, of the last century uh, in this parameter. And it was shown that uh, the uh, ortho power ratio remains conserved for basically the length of the, uh, the, the lifetime of the universe if it's not in the presence of one of these paramagnetic substances. Now, I don't want to give the impression that we understand everything there is to know about OPRs because, in fact, the exact interpretation of the OPR is still controversial. We don't really know, based on laboratory measurements, how long the conversion time is. Uh, yet we do see this, and when we look at two dissimilar species, for example, uh, Kawakita uh, has looked at the spin temperature in ammonia, and he finds that if you Say for water, he does can do water as well. But say you do water, it has an OPR of maybe 2.4. Ammonia will have an OPR of 1.0. Very different. But when you convert that to a spin temperature, they are the same. So that's telling you that these two molecules have experienced the same physics, the same, uh, if you like, Boltzmann physics that has set their spin ratios at their respective values characteristic of that common temperature. And uh, that's a very strong line of evidence. We're now pursuing uh, uh, methane uh, as are others. Uh, we want to do this for ethane as well and other hydrocarbons like uh, formaldehyde. Like Mike DeSanti is pursuing that, for example, and, and so on. So we think this is a very important uh, uh, cosmogonic parameter and uh, we want to fully exploit it. And as uh, as instrumentation improves and more time is available to telescopes, so we are in fact doing so. In fact, that's very reassuring. I think the other nice thing about it is it provides, I think, the best estimate we have for mid-plane temperatures in regions where the comets form. So for theorists like me, it's great stuff to know. Thank you. You bet. Okay, one last opportunity to ask Mike any remaining questions, and I'm sure you can pursue things with him offline. And if not, Mike, thank you again for a very, very informative talk. Thank you. Uh, and thank you as well. Thank you as well to everyone who is uh, still hanging in there with us 90 minutes after we started. Uh, remember that on Monday of next week we'll be hearing from Roger Summons and on Wednesday of next week from Karen Meach for the MIT and Hawaii teams, respectively. And we'll see you then. Bye-bye.